Uh, it's good to see you guys. Good to be with you. It's good to pray with one another. Uh, Luke 24 is where we're going to be. Dive in there if you would. Luke 24. Let me ask you to continue to pray. Whoever you prayed with today, pray, continue to pray this coming week. One of the greatest gifts we can give one another is just to pray for one another. There's great encouragement to be found in that, but there's great power to be found in that as well. So good to be together. Luke 24, two weeks left in Luke. Yay! One of my, one of my favorite, did I say that last time? If it gets in the 20, uh, 2022 and we're, I'm still saying that, let's, let's talk, all right? So um, today uh, we come to one of my favorite narratives, one of my favorite sections in Luke. And um, it, it's cool because I like it because it's like we get a reader's edge to what's going on in the story, meaning there's, there's characters involved in the story and we're privy to information they don't have. And I, and I like this kind of setup. Anyone grow up watching the show called Candid Camera? Oh, yeah. You remember Candid Camera? Well, that was for like the older generation. I don't remember it because I'm not that old. But um, my generation had punked. Do you guys remember punked? Uh, with that guy, what's his name? So cute. But yeah, that guy. Uh, so Candid Camera turned into punked which now today's generation has impractical jokers. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Young, the, young, the, young, the young kids know about that today. So all of them are based upon the premise that there are unsuspecting people involved of, in some sort of trick. Some sort of like, we're going to pull the wool over your eyes, but we as the viewer have the advantage. Isn't it fun to kind of know what's going to happen, but then be involved in that whole process of like they're surprised? And I, I, I want to kind of do that in, in, for us as a church. Can we do that sometimes? Set up like some vans where we're telling people like, all right, Alicia, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go up to this total stranger on Mill Avenue, and you're going to do the worm on the sidewalk right in front of them, right? Wouldn't that be fun? So, so start stretching. Get ready for this, right? And, and have people watch, like, what's going to happen? What's going to be the surprise and the element of just, whoa, on those people's faces? Well, that's what we get in Luke 24. It's like God's candid camera. And you get the edge because you get to know what's going on while the people that the prank is being played on come to find out this realization, this disclosure. So, and it's not really a prank. It's God getting to their hearts, which is, which is my prayer for all of us this morning, that God would get to our hearts through his word because that's what it's about, his word. So turn to Luke 24. Today we have this, this, this advantage to kind of see uh, the big orchestration of what's going on. And, and this is called the Emmaus Road. These are the two disciples on the road to this, this village called Emmaus, probably their hometown, seven miles from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is what uh, a lot of crazy events have just taken place, right? It's in Jerusalem that Christ was crucified. Uh, he was buried. There's now rumors that he's risen again. These two disciples are leaving Jerusalem and they're discouraged because the, the plans of God have not worked out according to their own understanding. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever thought God was going to work in a particular way and he does it and you're just like, that's a bummer. And it kind of leaves you despairing, maybe keeps you, it keeps you a little hopeless. So these guys are, and, and I'm, I'm almost venturing, we don't know, we know the name of one of them, Cleopas. Uh, so those of you looking for baby names, put that one to the list, Cleopas. So um, we don't know who the other disciple is. I'm going to venture out and say it's his wife. So it's husband and wife leaving Jerusalem, crestfallen, discouraged. They have to walk seven miles, which I don't know how long it would take to walk seven miles. I barely walk seven feet, but let's just say it, uh, it would take three hours. But the whole way, they're, they're kind of in this intense argument with one another. Anyone argue with their spouse before? Just, just curious. Okay. Come to date, date lunch with my wife and I. Every other week, we have a little argument about something. It can get a little intense, but you know what? We, we kiss and make up. So uh, that's what's happening to these disciples. And they have a visitor that meets them on the road. And guess who the visitor is? Jesus. But they don't know it's Jesus, right? Here's the candid camera, right? And so we get to see this dialogue. Now, this is an important passage. Why? Because these two are overwhelmed by sorrow. They are plagued by questions. And they're wondering where the heck God is. Have you ever thought those things before in your life? But God has this way of showing up. And I believe God has some powerful truths for us this morning. Luke 24 is where we're going to be. So turn to Luke 24, starting at verse 13. 
we pick up the account, and it says this, Behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, so it's about seven miles outside of Jerusalem, which Luke says, and they were conversing with each other. The word conversing literally means debate. They're debating with one another. Now, I don't know about you. It's one thing to feel sorrowful. It's one thing to feel hopeless. Now you're in a debate with somebody. Sometimes things don't get better by adding another person to the equation. Amen? So they're debating with each other about all the things which had taken place. Right? They're confused. Things didn't work out the way they thought they were going to work out. And it came about that while they were conversing and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. Now here's the secret, verse 16. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Now this is an outside agency allowing them not to see who Jesus is. And there's a reason why they were prevented from seeing who Jesus was. I'm going to tell you why this is important in a moment. And he says to them, so he's just a stranger, saying, hey, what's going on, you guys? <laughs> Where are you going? Starts walking with them, right? And he says, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still looking sad. So this stranger comes along and says, what are you guys talking about? Right? In much fancier terms, right? Don't go to work tomorrow and come up upon a conversation and say, what are the words you're exchanging with one? It's so proper, isn't it? And he's, he asks them a question, and what do they do? They stop, and they're just like, right? like, and one of them named Cleopas and answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things that have happened here in these days? Literally, come on, man, are you clueless or what? <laughs> Literally, that it, it's frustrating, biting sarcasm. Like, dude, are you so out of the loop you don't have a clue what's going on? And I love how Jesus is not put off by the sarcasm. Amen? I like how Jesus isn't like, don't talk to me like that. Look, I'm the Lord, right? Like, surprise. He doesn't do that. Look at, and he says to them, what things? Jesus is aiming for the heart. He knows they're hurting. And hurt people sometimes don't respond in the most eloquent and gracious of ways. So he goes deeper. What things? He wants to unpack their hearts. And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people and how the chief priests and, and the rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified him. And we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. You hear hopelessness in that statement? We thought it didn't deliver. He didn't deliver. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things have happened, right? They're connecting it like, and he said in three days something was going to happen, and we're not connecting the dots, and we're mad. Some of the women also, verse 22, amaze us because they're going around saying that the tomb's empty. It's not adding any sort of help to our lives. And they did not find his body. They came saying that he's, they've seen visions of angels, and there's just a lot of confusion, right? Verse 24, and some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and they found it empty as well, and, and we're just wondering where, what's going on. And he says to them, verse 25, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer? Circle that word in your Bible, suffer. These things, and to enter into his glory, circle the word glory. Suffering and glory go together. That's the problem. They don't understand that. Check this out. And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, circle the word all, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now again, they don't know it's Jesus. All they know is some dude is giving the most epic Bible study ever, right? And they approached the village where they were going and he acted, Jesus acted as though he was going to go further. He's pretending. Look at, look at how playful Jesus is. I love this. And they urged him. They said, no, 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 no. 
don't go any further. Come stay with us for it's getting dark out and the day is nearly over. And he went in to stay with them. And it came about that when he had reclined at their table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and he began giving it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the others gathered, the 11 and those who were with them, saying, the Lord has really risen. And he appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Two things I want us to, to notice here. First is this, that there's this priority of revelation that God uses to transform our lives. And the priority of revelation happens when the Bible is open. Hold up your Bible. Open Bible right here. Yeah! Some of you are like, I got my iPad, I got my iPhone, whatever, right? Open the word, which is step one of, of God's healing process. You, you are nothing without the word of God. How dare there be churches that don't open the word of God? How dare there be bodies of, of people gathered this very moment who are not opening the word of God? You and I, we've opened the word of God, step one. We're getting in the right direction, right? When the Bible is open, the revelation of God begins to, to take place as we see here in this passage. But notice the scene. Let's go, let's go back to the beginning. These two disciples are on their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that the, they're going in the wrong direction. Because did not the angels say to the women and some of the other disciples, Jesus will meet you in Galilee. Have you ever like been told to go a certain way and you're like, nope, I'm going another direction? <laughs> Step one of, of how to get lost and continue in hopelessness, don't go where God wants you to go. I'll meet you guys in Galilee. That's what the angel said. The Lord will meet you in Galilee. They go the opposite direction. They're going back home. Why? They've thrown in the towel. They are so depressed and discouraged. They're just like, nope. Nope, we're not. Do and isn't it just like the grace of God to say, fine, you don't want to meet me in Galilee? I'll meet you where you're going. Here's the faithfulness of God. He shows up because he cares for these guys. He shows up. And, and we're almost wondering, like, what would happen if Jesus just chose them to let them just go? He doesn't. He meets them because something remarkable is about to happen. Why? Because he's going to meet them in their defeat. And I'll tell you why they're defeated. It's because they are relying on their own point of view. Point number one, defeated and our point of view. If you choose to live life according to your wisdom, you will live a defeated life. If you choose to live your life according to your own understanding, you're going to live a defeated life. If you continue to look at all your circumstances through your own lens and through your own perspective, you will live a defeated life. Guaranteed. Remember that famous proverb some of us memorized even years ago, Proverbs 3? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own, but in all your ways. Recognize him. Acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. These two have forsaken Proverbs 3. Many of us have forsaken Proverbs 3. And we're like, Pastor, I feel so defeated. I'm like, you, you're relying on your own perspective. You're relying on your own point of view. You will always feel defeated when you neglect God's word. But when revelation is open, when God's word is open, then you get perspective. See, see notice this. Their circumstances did not lead them to an understanding of where God, what God was doing, right? They desperately were trying to sort through all the events that have just taken place in Jerusalem, but they didn't understand what God was up to. That's why Cleopas responds to Jesus, even though he didn't know it was Jesus at the time, like, dude, are you so out of the loop? You have no clue what's going on? Now, the irony is of anyone understanding what's going on, it's Jesus. Like, are you so, like, confused? Like, you don't know what's going on? And I wonder if Jesus just kind of maybe had this little smirk on his face, like, oh, I understand more than you realize. And I love it because, again, our Lord 
honors spiritual honesty. My God can handle God. You're not making sense to me right now. God, things are really confusing, and so far in my life, things aren't making a lot of sense. I'm mad. I'm angry. How many of you have ever gotten angry with God and felt like, darn it, I'm going to hell now? (laughs) Right? The Lord throughout Scripture honors spiritual honesty. I think of Habakkuk. Just write down Habakkuk. Just try spelling Habakkuk, all right? Read Habakkuk, three chapters, Old Testament. Here's how Habakkuk starts. Lord, I have no clue what you're doing, and I'm, I'm pissed about it. Lord, I don't know what you're doing. All I know is that you are not showing up in my life. The, the Habakkuk starts, it's just complaining, complaining, complaining. Then the Lord shows up, and then here's how Habakkuk ends. And I love the last verses of Habakkuk. Even though the fig tree bears no fruit, I will still love you, God. Even when the vine doesn't produce any fruit, I'm still going to love you. Even when that cattle barn is empty, I'm still going to trust you. Like there's this resolution. Like it, the Lord says, you can be honest with me. But give me an opportunity to speak into your life, and here's what will end up happening. You may not get all the answers you want, but you will get the answer you need. That your God's committed. And that's what these guys are going to experience right here. Spiritually honest people. And so here's Jesus. Instead of attacking them because of the, 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 the frustration, the sarcasm, he's, he goes a little deeper. What things? have taken place. Please explain this to me. Now, I'm at just a little side. Jesus doesn't barge in, which I have sometimes the spiritual gift of barging in. Anyone else like this? When people, you just want to come in and fix someone's situation and say, here's the answer. Here's what to do. Jesus doesn't barge in with all the answers, but he asks questions. Why? Because he wants to get to the heart. And I'm going to tell you right now, we can serve well as one another's counselors. Matter of fact, the body of Christ can be the best community of counselors that the world has ever seen. Here's here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to avoid us, and I'm, I'm not saying that professional counseling is bad. There comes a time when, but I think most of the time we as human beings need to connect genuinely with other human beings just to remind us that we're not alone in our, our pain and our suffering. Can I have you write down three things of how you can become a better counselor to one another? And you will get an honorary certificate that you are now a counselor. No. (laughs) Point number one, ask questions. Notice what Jesus does here. He models this perfectly. What things? Unpack what's going on in your heart. Don't sometimes, don't we have limited understanding and we hear someone say something and we immediately jump on them? I do that. I'm guilty of that. I hear someone complain about something, and I immediately step in and barge in, and they're like, that's not even really what I'm wrestling with. I'm like, all right, let me take a step back. <laughs> Ask clarifying questions. Give the person who's in pain the opportunity to unpack their heart because there's a lot that can be bottled up in someone's situation. And I'm going to tell you right now, a, a, a well-placed question or series of questions that allows that person to unpack their heart is precious. Secondly, notice what Jesus does. He ultimately takes them to the word. If you're asking questions, but you're not utilizing the word of God, your counseling will fall short. We are to be people of the book. Remember what I talked about last week? See, last week I talked about how we're people of the book. This week I'm going to talk about with the book, we're now people of the burning hearts. We're the fellowship of the burning hearts. The word of God is what ignites our souls. The word of God is what lights that fire of hope and optimism in our lives. You as a counselor, as you're unpacking someone's pain, ask God, number two, to how does your word speak to this person's situation? Number three, watch how Jesus shows up. Because when there's honesty matched with God's word, Jesus shows up. That's free of charge. I'm not charging you guys extra for that little counseling 
seminar this morning. But think about how valuable that is in our relationships, our interpersonal dynamics. If we were people that truly showed interest in one another's hearts and then brought the word of God to bear on our relationships and our situations, I wonder how much more Jesus would show up in our lives. This is what Jesus does here. He draws out the conversation, he teaches his word, and he ultimately discloses himself to these people. And they're blessed because of it. And I, and I wonder how much Jesus was wanting to show himself to them. Like, like I just want to pull back the, the disguise and be like, that's me! But he doesn't. Why? And I, and I kind of teased this with you a moment ago. Here's why he doesn't disclose himself at this moment to these people. He will ultimately do it. Here's why. These men need to first understand the facts of the gospel before they see the face of the gospel. Let me say it another way. If someone rejects the word of God, they'll never accept the work of God. Here's what Jesus is not going to do. He's not going to show himself without first grounding himself in God's revelation of the word. Too many people are looking for the work of God. They're too busy attaching their spiritual lives to miracles and things that are experiential and sensationalism. And I'm going to tell you right now that those things without the word of God are dangerous. Before you see the face of Christ, you first have to understand the facts about Christ. Before you understand the work of God, you've got to understand the word of God because the work without the word just leads to this experience-driven faith that will let you down time and time again. There are too many charismaniacs. I mean, charismatic, sorry. I'm charismatic with a seatbelt on. That's how I describe my life. I'm open to the spiritual gifts. I'm open to tongues and miracles and signs. But there's too many people that are so experience-driven, they're not grounded in the word of God. Be careful. So here's Jesus encouraging them, and here's the reason why they have, this is why they're discouraged. They failed to believe the word of God. If you continue to fail to believe the word of God, you will continue to be discouraged. You'll, you'll continue to be defeated. This is why point number two, there's a determination. Determined and God's point of view. Here's what I know. What does it say? Determined? Yeah, you're right. You got it. No, determined. You got it. Bravo to my wife who put together the outline. Here's what God's determined to do in the hearts of his kids. He wants you to see his perspective. With whatever's going on in your life, God's got a word for you. It's not a word found in experience. It's not a word found in, in other books of literature, other Christian writings, Christian radio, Christian music. His answer for your life, he's determined for you to see it in his scriptures. This is why we believe in the infallible, inerrant word of God. Genesis through Revelation, 66 books in the Bible, 39 old, 27 new, this is what God has given to us pertain to life and godliness. And he's determined for us to be anchored in his scriptures. So, Jesus says, oh, you foolish ones. He still doesn't disclose who he is, but he, 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 re he reacts. Almost like a, ch a parent to a child where you've said something at least a thousand times and they still don't get it. Any parents out there de deal with that? How many of you as parents have actually said, if I've told you one time, I've told you a thousand times? I think that's the spirit of what Jesus is getting at here. Like, all right, guys, really? We got to go back to this? Okay, let's do it. His plan is to give them the greatest Bible study ever. Side note. It's cool that Jesus hasn't disclosed himself up to this point. Because if it would have been Jesus, and they knew it was Jesus at this moment, they may have led and leaned on too much of the authority of the speaker rather than the authority of truth itself. Let me say something to you all. The power of the word of God is not in the speaker of the word of God. The authority itself rests in the word itself. What do I mean by that? It means Scott can share the truth. 
Merlin can share the truth. Carrie can share the truth. Kate can share the truth. God is not dependent on the ability of the speaker. God is going to use the authority of the word itself regardless of the speech and the powerful eloquence of the speaker whatsoever. Do we not need to hear this? Dwight Moody, I think, was the one who said it. He said, I believe that there are a lot of people who can preach the gospel better than me, but no one can preach a better gospel. Meaning, you shouldn't be thinking, oh, Pastor Scott has such a way of sharing the word. We just need to get people to church to hear the gospel. I'm going to tell you right now, you are the first line of defense. You're in their life for a reason. Don't discount your presence in someone's life and whether you're eloquent or not. What did Moses do before God when God said, hey, go to Pharaoh? And he's like, I can't speak. And God said, did I ask if you could speak? He says, I have given you a tongue. I have given you a mouth. And I don't care how it comes out, how clumsy or how confused. Just tell them my truth and let me work in those words. The authority, ladies and gentlemen, is on the words of God, not the speaker of the words of God. And when God's word works, look out. This is why Paul says, we don't come to you with eloquence of speech as if that's something we're going to lean on. The power of God is in his truth itself. How many of us need to hear that today? Trust the word to do its work. God is going to work through his word. He's not depending on you and your performance. He's not depending on you and your presentation. He's going to use his word, and his word will work powerfully. Woo! We need to hear that, don't we? So here we are, two hours. They're two, three hours. They're on this journey, and Jesus unpacks the word. And I'm going to tell you right now, the, the fire that had gone out because of what they witnessed at Golgotha is now being rekindled inside their hearts. And I'm going to tell you right now, all of us have this little furnace and this little oven growing on, going on inside our soul. The only kindling God has for you to burn that fire is his word. So check this out. Jesus takes them on what we call the scarlet thread of redemption. This is a cool phrase. Write that down. The scarlet thread of redemption. 66 books, all connected by one theme. 40 different authors have written over 1,500 years. This is why the Word of God is a powerful, powerful tool. The scarlet thread of redemption tells us that the Bible is all about Jesus. And what I love about this is that Jesus, he tells them this, it's, it's all about me, as he's going to disclose himself to them. Don't forget about the verses like Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But also, secondly, what you need to understand is 2 Corinthians 5, 7, which says, walk by faith, not by sight. So what do we see here? Look at verse 20. 526 he says to them oh foolish ones of slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken did you circle the word all here's the problem selective reading has led them to be defeated selective portions of scripture right don't we all have like our favorite sections of the bible and then we avoid those sections that are a little bit bothersome a little bit confusing god says uh 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 you don't get a hall pass. You need to understand all of Scripture because what tends to be uh, the tendency is that we, we, we all go to Psalm 23. Oh, the Lord is my shepherd. It makes my heart go like pitter-patter. I love that. But we reject the passages that say the Messiah has to suffer. Right? We read things like Zechariah chapter 12 that says, and they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn. And we sit there, oh, that's too sad. I'm not reading that. Give me the shepherd one. We don't want the pierced one. We want the shepherd. And the word all in your Bible, if you've circled it, this is the problem. If you only go to the scripture to take what you want and you disregard the things that are hard to accept, you're going to be discouraged. Because God has this uncanny plan, this, this interesting plan, course of, 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 of performing his work that says there must first be suffering and then there's glory. 
There must first be a cross before there is a crown. There must first be mourning, and then there's dancing. See, God has this amazing way when you read the scriptures that says with the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus is not an obstacle, but it's the very means in which God is bringing about redemption and will accomplish his will. You don't have Jesus without a cross because a crossless Jesus is not true faith at all. This is why the confusion, right? They're sitting there going, we know all the passages about a coming Messiah, and their minds are thinking he's going to be a military conqueror, he's going to be a political power. They did not factor in the suffering servant from Isaiah 53. This is why Jesus shows up and says, we're going to look at all the Bible. As he unpacks it, the amazing revelation begins. Jesus is on every page. Here's, here's the fun thing about being a, a follower of Jesus is that when you start to unpack the scriptures, you begin to see Jesus, Jesus on every single page of the Bible. And some of you, I believe this morning, are sitting there going, I don't know if that's true. Can I just demonstrate this for you real quick? And I don't want you to be so selective. I want you to see that Jesus is not only the subject, but he's the hero of the Bible. You'll see that suffering precedes glory. You'll, you'll see that humiliation precedes exaltation. You'll, you'll see that the suffering of the cross and the tomb really gives way to the resurrection, and that sorrow is ultimately turned into joy. You have 39 books Old Testament. You have 27 New Testament. The 39 books of the Older, Old Testament, which I like to call the Older Testament, write that down. That's a good little note. It's the Older Testament. It still has things for us to know today. They're not just works and books of antiquity. They are wonderful truths that God has maybe not written directly to us, but he has given for us. And what you have in the 39 books of the Older Testament is really Christ in the shadows. Christ communicated to us in analogies and pictures in types and rituals, things that are prophesied and anticipated, whereas the 27 books of the Newer Testament are the revealing of Christ in person, in truth, in reality, in the present, and, and when he has acknowledged all the things of Scripture really coming to light. Ladies and gentlemen, in the book of Genesis, matter of fact, turn to your table of contents real quick. Turn to your table of contents. For some of you on a digital format, it might be a little bit more difficult to find the table of contents, but for those of you who have the paper, the truly inspired word of God in paper, bounded form, turn to the table of contents, and you're going to see something remarkable. You turn to the table of contents, and we start with the book of Genesis. In Genesis, Jesus is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, Jesus is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is the atoning sacrifice. In Numbers, he is the bronze servant. Lifted up for all those who are bitten by the snake, they find healing in him. Amen, right? Deuteronomy, he's the promised prophet. In Joshua, he's the unseen captain. In Judges, he's our deliverer. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, he's the promised king. In Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, he is the restorer of the nation. In Ezra, he is our advocate. In Esther, uh, Job, he is our redeemer. In Psalms, he is our all and all. In Proverbs, he is our pattern. In Ecclesiastes, he is our goal. In Song of Solomon, he is our beloved who sings over us a song of love. In all the prophets, he's the coming prince of peace. And then you jump into the New Testament where Matthew, he is Christ the king. Mark, he's Christ the servant. In Luke, he's Christ the son of man. In John, he's Christ the son of God. In Acts, he's Christ the Ascended, seated, sending in all the letters of the New Testament. He is the Christ indwelling one, filling and revelation. He is the returning king, reigning forever and ever. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. Don't make me repeat this, please. <laughs> I will send this to you if you text message me so I can get your number. There's a, there's a catch. I will send you that list. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ is on every page. And there's not a word in our scriptures that is not divinely inspired, 2 Timothy chapter 3, that is not given to us for us to understand God, understand his person, understand his plans, understand his purposes, and how dare we only go to the parts that we like and disregard all the rest. We disregard the rest. Why? Because we don't want to suffer. We don't want to go through horrible times. We don't want, to, we don't want the frustration and disappointment to, to happen in our spiritual journeys. But here's the reality. It has to. Because God has to drive us to the end of our understanding of wisdom for us to even be open for him to speak and speak the truth. 
Stop trying to figure out life on your own. Stop trying to figure out your marriage on your own or how to raise your kids or how to spend money or, or what the world just continues to bombard, bombard you with. Go to the word of God. That is the only anchor for your souls. With God's word, you won't be defeated. He's determined to bring you back to the word. No one and nothing else will have the answer for you. Your goal now is to find Christ on every page. Find Jesus in every chapter. Find out how God is there. From Genesis chapter 3, where Christ has to suffer a bite on the heel in order for ultimately him to stomp and crush the head of the serpent. You have to go to Leviticus 16 where it talks about the day of atonement because there is a, a lamb that the sins of the people are placed upon and sent to the wilderness while Christ is that scapegoat. Don't tell me that Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. He had to go. This was God's plan before the foundation of the world. He's the rejected prophet from Deuteronomy 18. He's the forsaken one from Psalm 22. He is the suffering servant from Isaiah 53. He is the pierced from, from Zechariah chapter 12. Don't tell me that suffering is not part and parcel of the Christian journey. Until you experience this, there is no glory, there is no crown. We must be suffering first before we're exalted. Our Savior went through this. The entire Bible, New Testament, is filled with this. First Peter, you want to read the treatise on, on suffering and faithfulness? First Peter, he's writing to a group of people who are suffering. And here's what Peter says of all people. Peter, you think Peter learned some lessons? You better believe it. He says, keep your head held high. Because we have a good and gracious king who's going to redeem and restore all things. Don't be like the world that suffers and has no hope. Be those in Christ who have hope. And when asked by others, how do you even manage? How do you even cope? How do you even deal? As you sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, you're, you're ready to give a response to the hope that's in you with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. As you first sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, you see Christ in everything, the word, the truth. You're now able to respond in a manner that the world is not expecting because they're hurting too. You have gentleness and respect because your hope is not in what the world wants to give you as an answer. Your hope is in Christ who is the answer. And all God's people said, I'm about ready to have an aneurysm up here. <laughs> Relief will not come to us without first God lovingly dragging us through his word. I use those words intentionally. I believe sometimes God grabs us by the spiritual nape of our neck and says, let me drag you through the word. <laughs> and then we see his promises that every promise is a yes and amen of God in Christ answered. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Christ is the yes and amen of God. Let me close with one more observation on this point. When God ordains things that happen contrary to our expectation, that shouldn't lead us down a path that God's word has failed. Isn't it, isn't it easy to go, well, God's word can't be trusted. Look how it didn't play out in my life. When God works contrary to what you're anticipating, it's not that God's word has failed. You have failed to search the scriptures as diligently as he has wanted you to. That's the problem. Because here's what I know to be true. He may not answer your frustration and confusion specifically, but he is going to reveal himself specifically. And when God reveals himself, his presence and who he is will matter more to you than any particular answer you're searching for. 
my God's a big God who has this amazing way of just humbling me repeatedly. The moment I get attitude, let's be honest, we all get a little attitude with God, he humbles himself. He shows Job, 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 you get attitude with God, read the book of Job. They go on and on and on. Job and his friends, if you want to call them that, friends. Job and his friends go on and on and on. 39, 40 chapters. Blah, 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 blah. And it's not until the very end that God shows himself to Job. And says, I'm not going to answer any of your questions and any of your complaints and any of your frustrations. Job, were you there when I even set the constellations in place? Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, were you there when I created the giant, uh, giant creatures that roam the planet? Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, and he just humbles. Because here's what God wants us to know. He is not at your beck and call to answer whatever question you're going to ask of him. He is present to show himself powerful and sovereign and purposeful that no thing will ever happen that ultimately won't be orchestrated for his glory and your good. Trust him. Who needs to hear this today? We all do. We're to be people of the word, people of the book. But we're also part of the fellowship of the burning hearts. Point number two, we'll close with this. See, not only is there the power of revelation when the Bible is open, there's the power of regeneration when the heart is open. And let me just tell you right now, this is only a work God can perform. When you, God turns your heart of stone into a heart of flesh. When F Ephesians chapter 2, God makes us alive in Christ. Only God can bring true spiritual life, right? Here, here's the problem. There's four problems that we're, we're presented with in, in, in Scripture. And I'm not saying only four, but there's four that I came up with. Number one, there's the intellectual problem, right? This idea that somehow through just reason alone, we can make sense of God. You can't do this. Right? Just give me facts. I know a lot of smart people out there who don't believe in God. Why? Because they're very fact and reason driven. There is an element of faith involved. <laughs> right? So there's an intellectual problem, right? Number two, what other problem? There's a biblical problem where we don't read all of scripture and people conclude uh, dangerous theological beliefs. Why? Because they haven't read the scripture in its entirety. There's people and they're part of groups we call cults who take things from the Bible and they create a theology around it without accepting all of the word of God. So there's a biblical problem where things can masquerade themselves as Christian or as biblical, but they're far from Scripture because they're just uh, cherry-picking whatever they want to believe. Third, there's the experiential problem, which I've already touched upon, where, hey, if it feels right, do it. No, don't just do you. That's horrible. <laughs> do Jesus, right? As Jesus is reflected in his character, his personality, his teachings, right? The experiential problem. I love Mormons, and I love the LDS community, but here's the problem. Whenever you talk to someone in the Mormon community, what do they rely their faith on? The burning in their hearts. There is a burning in hearts that is wrong. When it's not rooted in the gospel, it's not rooted in scripture, right? They'll hand you their literature, and they'll say, pray about it, God will give you the burning within. I don't know if that's, you know, that's not a good burning, all I know. And so there's the experience, the, the charismatic movement. I was roommates with charismatics. We'd, we'd stay up all night talking about the, the gifts of the Spirit. And again, they come back to, well, this is what I felt. This is what I experienced. And I'm sitting there going, I don't, it could have been the chili last night. I don't know what you're feeling inside, but let's not call it truth. But there's also this final problem. This is what we're going to talk about, the spiritual problem that ultimately God has to bring about salvation in the heart of anyone who's going to believe. Can we just admit we're powerless to save anybody? I physically beat my dad up when I was a teenager. Threw him up against a wall because I wanted him to believe in Jesus so desperately. You know what all I got out of that? 
was money out of my pocket to repair drywall. That's all I got out of it. You can scream, you can plead, you can beg, you can fight verbally, you can fight physically, but if God is not working on someone's heart, your efforts are fruitless. I'm not proud to say things like that. And even in, as I've, I've matured in Christ, I still think it's on me. I still fight those, those tendencies to be like, if only I deliver the word powerfully enough, someone's going to change. And God says, please humble yourself, Morgan. Please, please stop and let me do the work. Because if God doesn't work, you will just get tired and tired and tired. Look what happens. He explains all the scripture, right? And all of a sudden, they wanted more. You know you're connecting with God when he creates this, this insatiable thirst for more. Here's what I know God does. He makes you want, desire, crave Jesus more. If you don't have that desire, you are not digging in the word. Dig in the word and watch the desires happen. Jesus, don't leave us. Notice, he pretended he was going further. Like, he just wanted to see, like, what, how are they going to respond? Hey, guys, good talking with you. I'm going on. No, no, no. Don't leave. We want to continue this. We want to keep talking. We love how you're, you're unpacking the scriptures with us. Please come. We've got bread. We've got wine. We've got fire. It's going to be awesome. He says, okay. Okay. Jesus loves to draw out those desires from us. He loves to be sought and desired. Because again, the word's all about him. He wants to show up to be that treasure that you want more than anything else. He stays with him, he dines with him. And now that he's revealed the plan, he can now reveal the person. Notice, there's a certain order to events. He must unveil the plan before he reveals the person. And notice how it happens. Look at the scene. Intimacy. And it's only in the intimacy of fellowship that God oftentimes reveals himself. They're sharing a meal. Common. It's not like a revival. It's not a crusade. It's not a concert. It's not a big church. It's, it's three people eating together. And sometimes it's in the most common places where we don't expect Jesus to show up that he shows up marvelously. Can I get an amen? See, this is where the, the experience is going to a, a big, like, cheerleaders for Jesus party, right? Like, no. You don't need that. Sometimes you just need two or three people sharing a very real and honest moment. Jesus hijacks the dinner. The the host would be in charge of breaking the bread. Here's what Jesus does. I'll take the bread, and I'll now break it and distribute it, distrib distribute it to you. Something in that moment opened the eyes to who he truly was. Maybe these disciples saw Jesus break the bread and fed the 5,000, and they recognized the movement. Maybe they had heard about how Jesus had broken the bread with the disciples on the, during the Last Supper. Maybe at that moment they saw the nail scars. We don't know what it was, but God, notice, verse 31, their eyes were open. This is a passive voice, meaning outside agency allowed them to see. God did it. And in God's perfect timing, he opened their eyes. And they're like, what? And then Jesus goes, bye-bye. <laughs> Just like God to do that, right? Like, really? You know what's cool is this, this story, this narrative can be called from heartbreak to heartburn. I, I, I think that's a perfect little little narrative. Notice, did not our hearts 
burn within us as he was unpacking the scriptures. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need more light. You need more heat. People are like, yeah, I just, I just need more. You know what God does? I, I think he wants to just slap you around a little bit. The moment you sit there and go, you know, God, you haven't done enough for me. You haven't given me what I wanted. You know, like, I'm like petulant little kids, and God just says, psh, psh, psh. really? I haven't done enough for you? You have the word. That's all you need. The Spirit of God works with the Word of God that ultimately results in the will of God then results in the wonder of God. That's all you need. You don't need more. You need more I, camping. I love camping. My wife and I have talked about, we need to go, more, go camping more, right? Maybe we'll do a big trip sometime as a church. We, haven't we talked about this? All right, JD's working on it. Her number's in there. Text her, yes, camping. Here's, here's my job. When I go camping, I'm the guy who wakes up early in the morning to come to a fire that's nothing but hot ash. And you know what you do? You throw more wood on it. Because the night before, it was raging, right? You're doing s'mores, you're playing guitar, smoking cigars, sipping bourbon, whatever you do on camping trips, right? And all of a sudden, you go to bed at night, and you just let the fire kind of die out. And you know what you do in the morning? You take advantage of those just little smoldering embers, you throw more wood on it, and then everyone else wakes up and goes, whoa, the fire's going. Like, yeah, because I woke up at 4.30 this morning. Horrible night's sleep. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you know what you do in the, in the fire and campground of your heart is that whenever there's ashen, barely smoldering embers, you throw more of the word of God on there. And you know what? Then you're a part of the fellowship of the burning hearts. And isn't it cool? Their response is, we're going to go back seven miles tonight and go tell the disciples what we experienced. They just walked seven miles. And now they're like, we got to get back. And they rush back, and they can't wait to share with the church what God has done. That, what, what a difference. What a difference. Sorry. What a difference. When you meet God in the word and he lights your heart on fire, when they come back to the church, they're all sharing with how God had lit them, their hearts on fire. What would it look like in our church if that was what we did on Sundays? We couldn't wait to tell you like, Miguel, come here, dude. I got this fire going. He's like, me too. I think that's what the church is. The church is a body of believers who cannot help but want to be collectively together to share what God is doing in their lives. I tell my wife this all the time. You know, there's part of us that are like, man, we want more people to be a part of this. But in reality, that's, that's not up to us. But as you're mixing it up with people out in the world Monday through Saturday, they're going to notice something about you. And there's something about the attractiveness of the, the fellowship of burning hearts out in a world that they're, they're cold, they're dead, they're, they're lifeless, they're fireless. Tell me more. Tell me more about the fellowship of the burning hearts. I'll tell you. It's about Jesus. It's about the word. You're here, I believe. Because I think you, 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 you've gotten a taste of that. Right? There's, there's no smoke machines, big screens, and pastors in tight jeans, thank God. <laughs> there's people who are sitting here of all certain types and sizes and ages and skin, whatever. And we're here and we've got the word of God open. Because I truly believe we're sitting there going, this is a, a, another opportunity for us to meet God and we get to do it together. Through his word. So let me invite others. Invite others. And it's not inviting them to a show. It's inviting them to a place where we believe we have found a wellspring of living water that is unceasing. 
we're not trying to build cisterns for us that hold no water, but we're find, we found a cistern that has water and it is unstoppable. And we're desperate. And we're hopeless. And we're, we're discouraged just like everybody else, but at least we can come together and, and keep pointing our, our, our sights towards true north. Jesus is true north. He is the treasure. So thank you, church. Thank you for sitting under messages that are well over an hour long at times. I know this, and church growth people are like, you shouldn't do that. I'm like, well, it's what it is. Because <laughs> I know for many of you, this is all the, the word you get. I pray that stops. I pray it stops. Turn off the streaming channels. Turn off your phones. Turn off and get into the word. There's no substitute for it. God is determined to light your hearts on fire. You have been created with hearts to burn for Jesus. Feed the fire. And all God's people said, Woo, let's stand, let's pray. <laughs> Father, thanks for today. Thank you for the fellowship of burning hearts. Lord, what a, what a gift you have given to your people. You have not left us empty-handed. You have not left us without direction. You have not left us without kindling. And that's what the Word is. The Word is the very thing that lights our hearts on fire. Lord, may we be men and women who are, who are courageous enough and disciplined enough to realize that we have done a poor job of keeping the fire going. Help us to recognize the priority of your word. Help us to hear the passion that you have for your, pe for your people, to be people of the word. And perform within us the work that you have longed to do, because you're not going to do it apart from your word. Lord, set us on the right course. May we experience what the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus experienced. May there no longer be, but be heartache, but there, may there be heartburn. And may it burn passionately for Christ. Thank you for being so good to us, for being so faithful to us, for loving us like you do. You deserve all the glory and honor and praise. And it's only in Christ's name that we can pray these things. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever. Amen.